Right off. And there we go. We are live. We're off the mark. Excellent. Cool. Um, morning, everybody. Welcome back. Welcome back to our fourth week of our um, level one vocational studies that we're doing. Of course, we're looking at overstanding, uh, un understanding and overcoming um, different barriers when it comes to fitness and good eating and stuff like that. So, of course, we've looked at things like healthy food labels, how we can um, understand now how the heart works and why it works, how it does. And um, what we're going to do today, we're actually going to move more into the fitness sort of uh, realm of things. And we're going to be looking at different types of fitness testing and training. So when we think of the word fitness, to some people, it means being really strong. To other people, it means being able to run really far or, or really fast. They're two different things. You know, we've got the 100 metres and the 1500 metres in the Olympics. So those are two different skill sets altogether. Um, you might be thinking of somebody who's like a bodybuilder, who's just really, really good muscle definition. That might be, you know, you might look at somebody like that and think, oh, they they must be really fit. You know, they might have really good fitness. But those athletes or those individuals have got totally, totally different skill sets you know different levels of different uh, abilities um and different goals at the end of the day you know so they'll be training differently, eating differently and we're just gonna have a little because i've seen it quite a lot over the years you know uh, in the gyms you'll see people trying to do like a little bit of everything all at once you know they're trying to get fit so they can run further while trying to lose body fat while also trying to put muscle on and it's like you're trying to do three things at once, you know, whereas if you shift your focus entirely onto one thing, like, okay, I want to lose a little bit of weight, I can do that. Then you can move on to something else and focus entirely on that next thing as well. So it's sort of like a, like a divide and conquer sort of approach, you know, you just got to pick one target at once, nail that and move on to the next one and get that one done as well, you know, start, start trying to put things in place to move towards that. So again, you know, where we all want to be in six months time is, is totally different, you know, which is where this idea of personal training comes in. It has to be personal guys, you know, so otherwise it would just be training, wouldn't it? And if there was one plan or one diet, or one exercise routine that worked for everybody, everybody would be doing it, you know? So really we want, we want to be thinking about those different, okay, what does, what does fitness mean to me? What do I want to work on? And um, at the same time, appreciating uh, and understanding different levels of fitness in different sports, different uh, hobbies, different activities, you know, because there's, there's more than just, there can be a lot meant by the word fitness or, or, or being fit. So let's have a little bit of a have a little bit of a jump in this one, guys. So what we're going to be looking at, we're going to be looking at different components, is what we're going to be calling them. So these different areas of fitness, these different aspects of fitness, we're going to be referring to as components. So different components of fitness, and that's physical fitness and skill related fitness, which we'll get into in just a little bit. Um, we'll be also looking into why specific fitness components are necessary to achieve excellence in sport. Yeah and exploring different ways to test your own fitness. Because like I say, we've got all these different components of fitness. Um, you might want to get a little bit more flexible. If you don't know how to test that, you don't know whether you're actually making progress or not. And again, you can actually be testing the wrong type of fitness. You know, if you were trying to train for a marathon, you couldn't just get onto a treadmill and do a hundred meter sprint and see how long that takes. Um, and if you're getting faster at that, you get faster across the marathon. That's not necessarily going to be the case, guys. All you're proving to yourself there, you're getting faster over 100 meters, which if that's your goal, excellent, happy days. But if you're training for something long distance duration, you know, that sort of training isn't actually going to translate across. So want to think about being smart with our training as well, guys. You know, it's not just no pain, no gain and hit the gym every day sort of thing. You know, you can actually, if you focus your approach a little bit more, you can actually end up saving yourself a little bit of time, you know, and again, talking about barriers to fitness. One of the biggest ones I've come across in my time in the fitness industry is, is time, people running out of time, you know. So if you can focus your, your gym sessions or your training sessions a little bit more, rather than doing an hour and a half at a time, you might be able to get everything into 45 minutes or an hour maybe, and you might only need to do it three nights a week instead of five. 
you know so in focusing you're actually buying yourself a little bit more time you know and potentially a couple of nights in the week i don't know you get in from work or, or whatever you've been doing through the day you think oh, i've still got to do my exercise um whereas a, cu- a couple of nights a week you might not have to if you're actually getting the right stuff in on the days that you are training guys so we're going to be looking at ways to test our own fitness and of course how we can kind of specifically target and develop these areas of fitness as well um okay guys cool so these physical fitness components so what we've what we've got we've got our six um components of physical fitness yeah so we've got our aerobic endurance yeah we've got our muscular endurance flexibility speed muscular strength and body composition yeah those are the six components of physical fitness that we're going to focus on today aerobic endurance muscular endurance flexibility speed muscular strength and body composition yeah so our aerobic endurance the first one that we just uh, that we just mentioned there it's the ability of the cardiorespiratory system which is essentially your lungs and your heart working together to bring oxygen in get it around the body like we looked at um, in a previous session you know so the cardiorespiratory system uh, to efficiently supply nutrients and oxygen to work in muscles during sustained activities yeah so the ability of the cardiorespiratory system to efficiently supply nutrients and oxygen to work in muscles during sustained physical activity. Yeah, so it's a case of how long can your heart and lungs keep up your body's demand for oxygen and all the other different muscles, yeah? Which is why when you're running long distance, you're going to start to get out of breath. Yeah, and it's essentially a case of how long does it take or how well are you able to do that for distance, you know, running, walking, whatever it might be, cycling. Um, you know, how how well can your heart and your lungs keep up, you know? Um, so thinking about sports that might require aerobic endurance, um, of course, something like, um, let's have a thing, aerobic endurance, of course, long distance running like we sort of mentioned a second ago somebody like Mo Farah is doing sort of like a, a marathon a half marathon great north run whatever it might be um and that is that is the system really in the body that's going to be working the hardest it's his heart and lungs because we know that running you know it works your leg muscles but not as not as intensely um as if we were doing like a squat on a lunge or something like that so it's really your heart and your lungs that are going to work the hardest while you're running um, and of course, the more capable your heart and lungs are at working at that higher level, the easier time you're going to have and the faster you're going to be able to go, guys, which is where that fitness level comes in. Um, so that is what we mean when we're talking about aerobic endurance. It's just your heart and your lungs ability to keep going and keep going through sort of sustained activity. Yeah. And get that oxygen and those nutrients around the body. Okay. So muscular endurance, focusing on that last part, that, that endurance side of things. So when we're thinking about endurance, we're thinking about sort of durability and, and your ability to do it over, over a long amount of time. So when we're talking about muscular endurance, uh, it's very similar to um, cardiovascular or aerobic endurance, but we're talking about the muscles this time instead. So it's the ability of a muscle to continue contracting or working yeah, over a period of time against a light to moderate load. So it's the ability of the muscular system to work efficiently usually for time, yeah, so over a longer amount of time, yeah, so it's not lifting one heavy thing once and putting it down, yeah, it's lifting something that's quite light or or medium sort of weight, but over and over and over again, you know, and when we're talking about muscular endurance and, and sort of lack of muscular endurance, that would be when your muscle tires out before your heart and your lungs can't keep up anymore sort of thing. That tells you that it's your muscular endurance that needs a little bit of work rather than the aerobic endurance. Yeah. Um, so muscular endurance, like I say, that might be, um, so we'll come back to how to monitor these on the way back through. So uh, naming a sport that requires muscular endurance, I think of things like, um, and, and, and need to be really fit as well. But at the end of the day, guys, if those leg muscles get tired and burn out, they're not cycling anywhere really you know so they need uh, cyclists need good muscular endurance to do hundreds thousands of repetitions you know where you're cycling and pedaling and pedaling and pedaling um so muscular endurance might also come into 
um, stuff like rowing. Yeah, you know, competitive rowing where they're in the boats and they're doing sort of like big strokes. Of course, there's a lot of pulling movements going on there. So if those back muscles get tired and your arms get tired, you're not going to be able to actually pull yourself through the water sort of as as um, as strongly or as, as powerfully. So that's just uh, another example of where sort of muscular endurance might come into play. Uh, flexibility, I sort of talked about um, a minute ago. Um, as we were sort of starting off the session. So flexibility is probably one of those that you, terms that you've come across before without even realizing that it is kind of a, its own aspect or component of fitness. So it's adequate range of motion in all the joints of the body. Yeah, so it's the ability to move a joint through its complete range of movement. So, of course, I know that I should be able to push all the way above my head. Yeah, if for whatever reason I get to there, I've got sort of reduced mobility. Um, if you, you know, if you feel a little bit tight as you're going down to tie your shoelaces or, you know, getting out of bed on the morning, putting your socks on, your lower back's a little bit tight, you know, your hamstrings are tight down the back of your legs. Um, that normally tells you that you need um, to just work on your flexibility a little bit. Um, but that is what we're talking about, guys, when we're thinking about flexibility. Like I say, it's all to do with range of movement at joints. You know, how high can you lift your leg, that sort of thing. Can you get that leg as high as your hip joint would let you go? Or do your muscles tighten up and, and put the brakes on that movement pretty much? Okay, guys, moving on to speed. So speed, again, a concept that we're probably all pretty familiar with. Um, but how does speed actually work? So speed, when we're looking at it, it's, it's a calculation, really, at the end of the day. It's um, speed is a result of distance in meters divided by the time taken to go across those meters. Yeah, you can actually calculate somebody's speed. Yeah, so the faster an athlete runs over a given distance, the greater their speed. Yeah, um, so if we're thinking about a sport that requires speed, thinking something like a 100 meter sprint, yeah, where that's going to be really sort of make or break to help you get at the top of at the top of your game. Yeah. Other sports, you know, we might be talking sort of um, competitive sort of ball sports where um and speed might not necessarily be required, but it might give you an edge in certain positions. You know, if we're talking football, you know, if you're a, if you're a winger or a fullback, being a little bit speedier, being some strikers, some some forwards, and um, some goal scorers over the years have made a career out of just being fast. You know, you're going to be the first one to get to the loose ball. You can sort of make those runs down the channels and give the defense harder work to do. You know, then we're coming across into stuff like um, basketball, rugby's all the same, tennis and squash, where you need to move around the court and actually move it move quickly. Yeah, so speed can be um, sort of. A, de a sort of decisive factor in a lot of different sports. Um, but of course, there are some sports like your 100 meter sprint where speed's pretty much a sort of requirement to be able to do it, um, certainly at a professional level. Okay, that's cool. So, muscular strength, when we're talking about muscular strength. So, muscular strength is kind of um, the opposite of muscular endurance. So, muscular endurance is a lightweight for a long time this is the other way around so it's the maximum force a muscle or muscle group can produce yeah even if it's only once so you might be doing um you might be doing a bench press doing as, as many as you can or a deadlift like just just as heavy as you can for one rep or whatever it might be um so big big difference between muscular endurance and mu muscular strength so for example, again, you know, thinking about muscular endurance, we're thinking about maybe it's like boxing because you've got to be moving around. You've got to be able to throw punches. You've got to be able to dodge. You've got to be able to duck. Muscular strength isn't going to help you out as much in something like boxing as um, muscular endurance will. Yeah. Muscular strength is going to be much more important in stuff like powerlifting, strongman competitions where we're doing the Atlas Stones or when you're pulling jumbo jets or 18 wheelers or whatever it might be, you know, um, Olympic lifting, you know, where they go in and just lift the weight once up to there, up to there or whatever it is. And then they put the bar down and they're done, you know, four years of training for five seconds worth of whatever it is, you know, it's, it's, um, it, that's it. They do it once and it's, it's pretty much done. Um, so that is, um, not only the best way to, um, 
check your mus- muscular strength, but also the best way to develop it. You know, if you just gradually work on, you know, I only do it once, but I'm making it heavier every day, sort of thing. Your muscular strength is is only is only going to come up, um, sort of come upwards. You know. So sports that may require muscular strength a little bit more. Again, we might be talking. Um, there's a little bit of it involved in sort of rowing because, of course, when you're pulling, you need it to be powerful as well. Uh, you don't just need those muscles to contract. You need them to be strong. Um, at the same time, muscular strength, we could be talking stuff like rugby if you're in a scrum. Yeah, sort of like contact sort of stuff. Um, and muscular strength, again, coming back to football. Um, I've seen, again, football has made a career out of being, being strong. You know, I remember Alan Shearer did his knees um, and he was never as quick. So he just got really strong and he got like really hard, like put, go and then push it off the ball, take it, take it from us. So different, um, like I say, different positions and di- different play styles in certain sports. Um, but but yeah, when it comes to muscular sort of strength, we're talking just moving a weight probably once, twice, um, and then sort of just put, putting it down again. So big, big difference to mus- uh, muscular endurance. Okay, guys, next one we've got then. Next one we've got is body composition. So body composition is just your, um, it's what your body's made up of, really. It's the, the ratio of fat mass to fat-free mass, yeah? So we're talking about fat mass against fat organs, muscle, bone um, in the body, yeah? So we're thinking about, it's normally, you know, more about the aesthetic, you know? How does, how does somebody look? You know, a bodybuilder who gets on stage at 12% body fat, you're not going to see his muscles anywhere near as clearly as somebody who gets on stage at 6% body fat. Yeah? So the lower your body fat is, usually the more you can see your muscles defined. Yeah? Because, of course, for all we joke, you know, I've got no abs, I've got no abs or whatever. Like You do, we just can't see them because, truth be told, guys, it doesn't take much body fat at all or a high body fat percentage to start to hide your abs um but they are they are there guys you know we, we we've all got the same sort of musculature uh, we've got the same muscular system um give or take you know so like i say when we talk about body composition it's just a case of how much of you is lean muscle how much of it is bone uh, and how much of it is um actually sort of body fat you know stored body fat um which Again, can give us an idea, you know, you might see somebody who looks really, really lean, you know, they've not got much fat on them, and you might think, oh, they're really, really fit. And all it is, it's a particular body composition, yeah? When you think about it that way, someone who is really slim or really lean, you've got no evidence that they can run a long distance or lift something really heavy or, you know, whatever, any of these are the types of components of fitness, so a, a, a certain body composition doesn't actually dictate your other levels of fitness, you know, which is why I don't like to get fixated on the aesthetic side of things too much. You know, it's about performance. It's about how you feel. Um, you know, I've, I've mentioned before, when a bodybuilder gets on stage on, on show day and is at his most depleted, you know, he's at his lowest body fat level. But then, you know, when you look at it from a nutritional point of view, um, and an energy point of view, they're not really that healthy at all. You know, they've lived on a on a restrictive diet probably for up to six months before that day. You know, um, they've been very, very, usually very limited to what different foods they're having because eating the same foods all the time gives them a chance to get used to it. So when they actually get on stage, they can be sort of quite weak and depleted, really. So they're not actually at peak performance when they get on stage. They're just sort of peak physical appearance, which is what it is at the end of the day, guys. That's what bodybuilding is. But a bodybuilder couldn't come off stage, look and rip the death with all of that muscle and go and compete in like a strongman competition because he would get absolutely blown out of the water, you know, because they train differently and they prepare differently so again what's important to you what do you want to work on like when i first started at the gym i got um i wasn't qualified as a pt i've never done anything like this so i just like liked being active really you know so i actually joined the gym with one of my mates um who was doing what i realized now was strength training yeah so he was doing a lot of strength training um so he was doing sort of really heavy weights not for very many 
not lifting them many times, you know, not doing very many repetitions um, and then having quite a prolonged rest. So you've got, so you're fresh and you can lift, lift heavy again, you know. Um, so like I say, when it comes to um, body composition, it's not the, it's not the, the it's not the be all and end all at, 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 the, at the end of the day. Um, I was actually going into the gym to try and put a little bit of weight, like muscle on, not necessarily weight, um, but try and build like a little bit of muscle and just just stay fit, you know. Um, I wasn't necessarily worried about anything too much at the age of sort of what was I probably about 18, 19. I probably wasn't even thinking about that sort of thing. So I got roped into training the same way that another lad was training. Um, and it for about six months, I wasn't I was getting stronger, but I wasn't necessarily putting any muscle on. Um, and of course, I had no idea at the time about these different these different components of fitness. You know, training to build muscle is totally, totally different to just going in and lifting heavy stuff. You know, li lifting heavy weights once or twice, put them down and rest. So, you know, again, I in those six months could have made much more progress if I'd have focused on training the way that my ideal goals and my end game goals um, actually sort of were, you know, if I'd have paired them up a little bit better, I'd have spent those six months a little bit better. Um, but of course, it's all a learning curve, guys, isn't it? You know, I, I educated myself and I learned about all of this sort of stuff. And I thought, you know what, I'm going to change my training and I'm actually going to train the way that I want to train now rather than the way that somebody else is. But I'm well aware when you're first starting off, it's easier to just sort of jump on what somebody else is doing and follow what they're doing rather than worry about doing the wrong thing or, or panicking about anything like that. So, you know, maybe try and find somebody, even if it's myself, you know, who you feel comfortable asking the questions to, you know, maybe it'll be a gym instructor or a member of staff or maybe it's another, maybe it's another member, even, you know, that you can, you can pick their brain a little bit and find out a little bit, you know, about, um, speak to them a little bit about your goals um, where you'd like to get to and, and, you know, how they think you should be exercising to hit them, you know, but yeah, if you're not so sure, drop me an email. I'm, all, I'm always happy to help with that sort of stuff. Um, okay, guys, well, that's body composition anyway, guys. So like I said, we're talking pretty much about the aesthetic side of things. How much fat is somebody carrying? How much of them is organ, muscle, bone, whatever. Um, so those are our six components of physical fitness. Yeah. So just a little bit of a recap before we move on. And then we're going to talk about how we can actually monitor these as well. Yeah. So um, aerobic endurance, of course, we mentioned is the ability of the cardiorespiratory system to efficiently supply nutrients and oxygen to work in muscles during sustained physical activity. Yes. Yeah? So over a longer amount of time. So how can we monitor aerobic endurance? I've found that the best way um, to monitor aerobic endurance is literally with like a stopwatch or a timer. Um, and a little bit of cardio kit, you know, that is working more the aerobic side than muscles per se, you know. So if I know if, if I've got somebody on a treadmill and they're sort of running along at five, whatever it is, five miles an hour, five kilometers an hour, they're running along. I'm just going to time how long it takes. You know, they're running along at a steady speed. They're not, they're not sprinting. Um, they're just sort of running along at a steady speed. How long can they go before they quit or how long can they go before they can't continue anymore yeah it's a really good way of monitoring aerobic endurance you know it might be it's why a lot of people time their runs when they go out for a run you know let you know okay i've done the same route again today oh, i was a little bit faster i'm making progress uh, oh i was a little bit slower today i wonder if i'm you know not not doing something right or if i'm just a little bit tired if i'm a little bit fatigued you know, maybe you do a couple of runs in a row and you notice they're all getting slower and you think, right, OK, what's what's going on there? How can I change that? You know, without monitoring it and without doing like a proper test to see whether you're getting faster or slower, you've got no idea whether the way that you're training is actually working in the way that you want it to. Yeah, you could be really, really, you could be trying to work on your aerobic endurance and you're getting you know, good muscular strength training, good muscular endurance training. You go on a run and your aerobic system, your, your cardiovascular system still still can't keep up, you know. So all of that training you've done hasn't let you do what you wanted to do, you know. So, again, that's why we've got to think about being smart with our training and pairing it up and making it sort of reflect our um, uh, sort of end game goals. 
Um, so yeah, that's, that's a good way to monitor aerobic endurance. What you could also do to an extent, I guess, would be pick a distance and say how long it takes them to run over that distance. Yeah. So it's again, that's a little bit speed involved, but the longer you, the longer of a distance you pick, the um, the sort of the longer of a distance you pick, the more it's going to be about that um, endurance side of things as well, and not just sort of pure speed. Yeah. So aerobic endurance again, it might be stuff like I remember we did um, we did a not the, yeah the Cooper test. We did the Cooper test in school, and that was essentially sort of like. I can't remember how many. It was like a perimeter of cones that was set out, and every single cone meant that you've gone like a meter or something like that, or two meters, and you would have 10 minutes and you would see how many cones you could run past. Yeah, you know, so it is the same again. Um, you might set a timer on it, you know, and say five minutes. How far can you how, how far can you get? You know, how is that aerobic endurance working, even when you try and push yourself towards the end of the exercise? Um, so, yeah, a couple of different ways we can check aerobic endurance. Um, muscular endurance is um, it's very, like I say, so muscular endurance, like we said, the ability of a muscle to continue contracting over a period of time against a light to moderate load. Yeah, it's the ability of the muscular system to work efficiently um, over time. Yeah, so we talked about stuff like cycling, where the leg muscles need to keep firing over and over again. And um, how can we monitor muscular endurance? Um, so we could, same again, you know, we could time cycling and see, you know, is it your legs that's suffering and struggling to keep up or is it your heart and your lungs? But muscular endurance as well, we can just do stuff like um, exercises till failure, you know. So if you want to work on your um, muscular endurance in your upper body or in your arms, get yourself a lightweight do bicep curls. Count how many it takes before you can't do anymore. And before your muscle burns out, yeah. And then next time you do it, how many bicep curls can I get? Oh, okay, I've got a little bit further. My muscles, um, my my muscular endurance is improving, yeah. So again, you can you can be really strong and have no muscular endurance at all. So after two or three reps of something, your muscles just going to shut down. Doesn't matter how strong you are, yeah. At the same time, you know it works the other way around. You can have all the muscular endurance in the world. Your muscles might be able to keep going and keep going and keep going forever. If they're not strong enough to lift up a certain thing once, then they're not strong enough. You know, they're two totally, totally different things. Um, but that is how I've always measured muscular endurance, getting like sets till what we call failure. It's where the muscle won't work anymore. Like I say, it could be overhead press till failure. See how many you do before your shoulder muscles give in. You know, it gives you a good idea of muscular endurance and whether it's got better or worse since the last time you did it. Okay, guys, flexibility. So have an adequate range of motion in all joints of the body, the ability to move a joint through its complete range of movement, like we said. Um, sport that requires flexibility. I think we might have actually skipped past this one, actually. So sport that may require flexibility. Of course, we could be talking gymnastics, dancing. This game can usually require your body to be in a lot of different positions um, and to have a good amount of flexibility in doing it. So when it comes to flexibility, guys, I mean, you can do sort of like your own tests day to day how how easy does it fail to go down and tie your shoelaces does it fail harder some days than others does your back feel a little bit tighter or do your legs feel a little bit tighter but there's actually specific tests we can do to check flexibility as well so one of them is like a what we call a sit and reach test so what you do you sit with your legs straight sort of um you've got a box yeah and you're gonna sort of sit you're going to sit in front of the box with your legs straight and your feet touching the box. And what you're then trying to do is reach forward. Can you even touch the box? Yeah. If you can touch the box, how far across the top of the box can you actually slide your hands? Yeah. Before your lower back or your hamstrings stop you going any further. So you might get two centimeters you might get five centimeters and again that's a really handy way of measuring your, uh, your flexibility to see if you're getting a little bit more flexible as time's going on um, and again it might tell you you know um you might need to focus on your flexibility a little bit more you know i think a lot of us are going to be a lot tighter than we realize you know um back into this year after you know lockdowns and pandemic and sitting around for 
you know, potentially a year and a half, depending maybe you've gone to work at home or, 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 or something like that, you know, maybe you just restricted tomorrow hours indoors than 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 pre-COVID, you know. Um, we've all or a lot of us, sorry, I, I shouldn't say us all, a lot of us have sat around a lot more and not moved as much as we normally do. And I think that that flexibility is going to be um, a, a, a little bit um, hesitant to come back uh, quite as quick unless we actually work on it. But, you know, you might be doing things like, okay, I want to I wanna get my muscular strength a little bit better, my aerobic endurance, I want to be a little bit better. Or maybe work on flexibility at some point. Maybe those other two components really start to develop and you get to a point where they're happy and then you think, okay, right, it's really time to make the flexibility side of things like the main focus. And then you change your training up totally. You don't necessarily drop all of the other stuff. You just become a lot more focused on the flexibility side of things than your training and your exercising and your movements are going to be a lot more focused on that instead. You know, same again, talking about focus primarily on one thing and you tend to find other stuff comes as a little bit like a byproduct anyway you know like for example if i am doing um a lot of squats over and over again yeah my muscular endurance in my legs is going to get good but my aerobic endurance is also going to get good because those muscles still need oxygen and my heart and lungs are working harder to get the, the the oxygen and the blood to those muscles as well. So my aerobic endurance would be improving really while my muscular endurance is as well, but that's through through the type of training that I would be doing. And um, like I say, flexibility would be a lot more sort of just stretching, yoga, that sort of stuff. Really, really good for flexibility. Okay, guys. So next one we've got there, we've got speed. So we said speed is um, distance uh, divided by time taken. Yeah, so of course, the faster an athlete runs over a given distance, the greater their speed. We talked about, you know, a 100 meter sprint is probably going to be the most beneficial um, or get the most out of speed. How do we monitor speed? Same again. Um, we try and replicate it, really. We try and replicate it um, in controlled circumstances. And so we can repeat it over and over again. So in this case, it might just be. A hundred meter sprint, you know, how fast can you do it? Yeah. How fast can you do that hundred meter sprint? Um, and then next time you do it, are you faster? Are you slower? Are you getting quicker or are you not? Yeah. Monitoring your speed. If you're doing like, you could be thinking to yourself, right, I'm going to get faster. I'm going to get loads faster in six months time when running season comes around again. And you might do loads of exercise in the gyms. You know, you might really work on your leg muscles, your upper body muscles, your core strength. If you never do any speed training and that, and that sort of replicating that 100 meter sprint feeling, you'll get to the day and you'll probably be no faster. You might even be a little bit slow because you're probably carrying a little bit more mass, you know. So you tend to not really get any faster unless you're trying to, trying to focus on that side of things. Yeah. So um, when we're thinking about speed, um, something like, like I say, a 100 meter sprint. Um, can be can be really really sort of helpful. Or again, you might put a timer on it. You're gonna be like, okay, you've got 20 seconds. How far can you run? You know, how far can you get? That sort of thing. Okay, guys, muscular strength, muscular strength. So the maximum force a muscle or muscle group can produce, like we said. How do we monitor muscular strength? Same again, just 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 rinse and repeat. Yeah, if you're um something like a squat, yeah, something like a deadlift, a big full body a big full body exercise that uses a lot of muscle all in one go. Um, like just, just go in the gym and, and do it. Of course, warm up properly and stuff like that. But you know, each time you're doing it, can you, can you lift a little bit heavier? Is the weight that you were lifting feeling easier? Is it going the other way, you know, and you're actually struggling to lift the weight that you did last week, you know, which can mean, totally different things you know maybe you actually need a bit more of a rest and you you're actually a little bit more knackered than you think um or you haven't eaten right or you haven't slept right or something like that but yeah it's a good way to check you know is it going in the right direction is it not are you getting stronger or are you not and the only way to check that guys really is to go and lift lift, lift some heavy stuff you know with good form um of course not take any stupid risks always warm up um but yeah thinking about um muscular strength that's the best way to do it, guys. Just pick a, a relevant lift. You know, again, you could do it just with biceps. It doesn't need to be a full body exercise. 
you might just be deciding, okay, I want to work on the bicep strength. You know, it might be specifically for helping you do pull-ups. You know, you might have realized, right, my biceps are a bit weak. I want to work on their strength. You'd be better off doing some heavy bicep curls. Yeah. And just not doing as many of them. You know, that muscle is still going to get stronger. Um, so you can actually develop muscular strength in specific muscles by, by sort of training like that. Okay, guys, body composition. Um, again, it's a relative ratio of fat mass to fat free mass as in vital organs, muscle and bone in the body. How can we monitor body composition? Normally, guys, it's going to be, um, we've got skin fold calipers, which will sort of nip certain areas of your body. It might be in the back of your arm. It might be sort of um, down your side or on your sort of sitting on top of your shoulder blade, that bit of your back. Um, and, and there's calculations that we can do based on pretty much, it's like a set of tweezers. Yeah, so it's going to nip. It's going to tell you how many millimeters of, obstruction is in the way from them actually being able to touch so in this case how many millimeters of fat are there from there we can do an equation that tells you okay this is um your percentage of body fat these days though we've got scales that'll give you a pretty good estimation of a lot of this stuff as well so you know you might have to go barefoot you get on a set of scales it'll tell you your weight it might tell you how much water you're carrying and then it'll probably tell you your um your, your body composition as well and your sort of your um, fat percentages, you know, so we've got technology like that that will actually do it for you. Some of them are handheld little devices, you know, they're not they're not 100% accurate all the time, but they can give you a little bit of an idea where are you right now? Does that number go up or does it come down again? Are you moving in the right direction or are you not? Yeah, because same again, moving in the right direction tells us, okay, the exercises that I'm doing, I'll keep doing them. If we're not moving in the right direction, of course, we realize that something needs to train. But one thing that we're not doing is wasting time, sort of fumbling around in the dark. And then, you know, six months down the line, we haven't actually progressed in the way that we wanted to, to progress. You know, I'm all for everybody getting the most out of their time and the effort in their gym. Because at the end of the day, 99, probably 0.9% of us do it just so the rest of our life is easier outside the gym, you know. We, we are there because it's sort of like a, a means to an end to be fit. So again, um, what we want to make sure that we're making progress and actually getting getting value for our time, I guess, because if we're not, it, it's it's time that we could be spending with, with family, friends, the kids, whatever, taking the dog out. Um, you know, it's all time we could be doing something else. If if you're just going to be doing stuff that's, that's not at all relevant to your goals and where you want to end up, you know? So like I say, I want everybody to get the most out of their time and the efforts that they're putting in. So that's where we've got to really drill down and, 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 and kind of focus on um, what, where it is specifically that we want to get to, guys. So those were the um, those are the six components of, um, well, yeah, six components of physical fitness. Just leave them up for just a second. So, of course, guys, if you ever need to come back to this video and sort of have a little bit of a, of a revise, you should just be able to go through and pick out individual slides rather than needing to listen sort of to the full session. Okay, guys, so that was that six done. Now we've got the five components of skill-related fitness. So not physical, it's much more to do with skill. Yeah, and we're talking agility, balance, coordination, power, and reaction time. Yeah. So maybe stuff that you might not have thought about so much to do with fitness, yeah? Our, when we think of fitness, these things might not necessarily come to mind first, yeah? But they are, um, they are different components that can make a big difference within different sports, activities. Um, so let's dive in and have a look. So agility is the ability to quickly and precisely move or change direction without losing balance, Yeah. So if we're thinking about a sport that might require some agility, again, talking about um, something, again, dancing, a lot of turning on the spot, a lot of moving, changing direction. Ice skating is exactly the same. You know, agility, um, it might be American football, rugby. You know, they, they, they'll sort of move in one direction and then quickly change direction and be somewhere else. So the person that was going to try and tackle them has got no idea where they were actually going to go and then they're away past them. You know, so agility can give you a little bit of a boost there as well. Um, I, it, 
huge in basketball, being able to quickly change direction, find a little bit of space, you know, again, make it look as though you're going to go one way and then change the direction and go somewhere else and sort of lose the, lose the opposition or the player on the opposite team. Um, so, yeah, that's how we're agility, changing direction um, quickly and precisely without losing your balance, yeah, and keeping that balance being a key thing. Okay, guys, so balance a little bit deeper. So the ability to maintain your centre of mass over a base of support, yeah? So when we're standing up, we've got our centre of mass, which is essentially us, um, over a base of support, which is our feet or our legs, yeah? Of course, you'll feel your balance change if you lift one foot up and you've only got one point of contact with the floor because your base isn't as supported. Yeah, your base, is, your foundation isn't as strong. Um, so that's what we're talking about when we're talking balance, guys. So we've actually got two types of balance. So we've got static balance, which is, you know, balancing in a position like a handstand, yeah, where you're not moving anywhere. And you've got dynamic balance where you need to keep your balance throughout a movement so like a cartwheel yeah or um like the, the proper olympic diving off the top boards that sort of thing takes balance any kind of floor gymnastics or a lot of gymnastics in general uh, requires good balance and um, so again it might not be the make or break in terms of can you do something or can you not do something but you know in certain situations balance again might might make or break how, how good at something you can be um, so yes, sport that requires static balance, you know, we said stuff like handstands, so static balance, um, again, thinking about even stuff like yoga, I guess, where you're, where you're coming into positions and, 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 and holding certain positions requires static balance a lot more than you think, actually. I started doing yoga quite a bit through lockdown because it was just obviously a form of exercise that didn't need much kit and stuff like that. And, you know, I soon realized I wasn't as flexible as I should be. And I, you know, my balance has come on quite a lot from, you know, standing on one leg and doing different things or being on all fours and only balancing on one leg, one hand, you know, that sort of thing. You know, it, it forces you to develop your balance a little bit more. Um, and of course, dynamic balance, we said sort of like Olympic diving, gymnastics is a lot of um, dynamic balance. Again, stuff like football, if you go up for a header, you've got to obviously land on your feet again. Basketball is exactly the same. You're going to go up for sort of like a, a putback or an alley-oop an alley or whatever it is that you're going for. And, you know, you've got to land on your feet. You see some really nasty uh, accidents from players going up and not managing to land on their feet. You know, you soon do an ankle or... or um, break something on on landing yeah so good balance um and again we're talking both static and dynamic balance there yeah. okay guys coordination coordination and um, so we're thinking about the smooth flow of movement needed to perform a motor task which is just movement really efficiently and accurately yeah so coordination i need coordination to pick up my phone from over here lift it over to here and put it precisely where I want to on that desk. Yeah. Um, coordination would come into play. I don't know if I'm going to go as far as class it as a sport, but darts is coordination. Of course, you've got to obviously see where you want the dart to go. You've got to get it to line up. You've got to sort of get the movement right. You've got to release it at the right point. I was always terrible at darts, truth be told. Um, but yeah, um, I don't think it's a sport. I think anything where you can have a pint, uh, while you're doing it, I don't know if it's uh, I don't know if it gets the classification of a sport. Certainly not in my book, anyway. Um, coordination applies to so much more, though, guys. Like it's not just sports. Um, of course, it it can apply to sports. We're thinking again, racket sports. If you see a tennis ball coming or a squash ball or um, the shuttlecock, if you're playing badminton, you can you can see where it is all you want. But if you can't actually pair up the movement to hit it back with the racket. You're never going to get anywhere, really. You know, you're going to you're going to have you're going to have a really hard time. So, again, like that coordination comes into play there. But even things like dancing requires coordination. You know, a little bit of moving. If you like, if you if you like, to have a little bit of a boogie. It might be stuff like playing the instrument. You know, for for somebody who who can't really dance and um obviously has two left feet and, and never been good at anything like darts or anything like that or golf um 
I'd say the where my coordination comes through is in like the music and um, that I play, you know, you think like playing a guitar, you've got to control this hand to do chords or whatever, the frets, and you've got to do the strumming with the other hand, you're either strumming or finger picking or whatever it might be. So you've got different things going on at once. Drumming, of course, if anybody's ever tried drumming, you've got like, you've got your, you've got like your beat going with your hand and then you try and bring your foot in as well at the same time. It's coordination, guys. Um, so again, it's not just sport where that can be a really, really um, big help. Um, but in our day-to-day lives in general, you know, I like a lot of this stuff can really, I guess, when you think about it, but um, coordination, definitely, you know, being able to sort of, um, like I say, smooth sort of movements and, and movement patterns and stuff like that. So, yeah, coordination. Sports, like I say, I don't know if I'd go as far as, uh, as for darts. Maybe golf, if we're going out on a push, of course, you've got to get that whole movement down. Coordination, we could be talking triple jump. Like, again, that, that was another one that used to get me, triple jump. I'm like, you've got to hop, skip, jump not fall over, not trip yourself over, do them all in that order, get the timing right. I'm just like, head was all over the place. <laughs> Couldn't process it. Like I was all right at the long jump as well, but triple jump, too many things to compute all at once. And um, I was just no good at it, you know? So again, coordination, um, it's a lot of implications. And like I say, it's not just certain sports. A lot of our movements that we do day to day requires some level of coordination. Um, okay, guys, so power. Power. So power is the uh, the work done or the force exerted in a unit of time. Yeah, so it's calculated the, follow- the following way. So the force in kilograms, yeah, by um, time's distance divided by time again. Yeah, that will tell us how, how much power has been outputted yeah how much power is actually being exerted so again coming back to power we're thinking about sports that need similar sort of stuff to um muscular strength so again sumo wrestling you need power wrestling in general you need power to be honest um again it could be quite helpful in rugby um but then same again um naming a sport that requires power um, i just thought of one there as well i thought of a good one and it's escaped as Right. Um, it'll come back to us. It'll come back to us. So yeah, sports sports that require um power, very usually pretty similar to sports that need um muscular strength as well, you know. But then we think about somebody like Usain Bolt, who you know, there is a reason that sprinters have usually have a good bit more muscle and, and, and more muscle definition um than long distance runners, you know, they need that power because over, over 3000 meters, it's your aerobic endurance. That's going to make or break it really. Like we say, um, how well can someone's heart and lungs keep up? That's a long time. Um, whereas 10, what, the 10 seconds or so probably on our, on average for a hundred meters, 10, 11 seconds. There's a lot less time for everybody else and all the competitors to really space themselves out. There's only so much difference is going to show up across 10 seconds, guys. So that's where power comes in really, really helpful. Yeah, so when when they're down, obviously, on the blocks, getting ready to start sprinting, when they start moving, they need power to drive them. You know, you see some some 100 meter and some short distance sprints won and lost in how hard they can actually push off the um off like the front board, you know, or, or the or the backboard, sorry, when they when they're about to start sprinting. So it's not always about outputting that muscular strength, you know, but power over a short amount of time can make a really big difference as well, which is why, like I say, somebody like Usain Bolt, he's got big muscular legs and muscular arms as well for punching through the air, whereas Mo Farah, he doesn't because he needs to be lighter. He benefits more from not having that muscle because if he was carrying that muscle with him, he's not going over 100 metres with it. He's going over 3,000 metres with it, which that muscle is going to slowly have um, a much bigger impact on his overall time because the longer he goes, the more that muscle will start to weigh him down. Yeah. 
Uh, okay, guys, just checking the time, seeing where we're at. So we've got, guys, we've got um, reaction time next. So for reaction time, we're thinking about um, the time taken for a sports performer to respond to a stimulus and the initiation of their response. Yeah, so how quick can you, um, like I say, intake, get that input that something's happening that you need to respond to and begin to respond to it, yeah? So um, can we name sports that require a fast action time? Um, one that's a little bit outside the box when you think about sort of, um, race car driving, yeah, for the Formula One actually needs a really good degree of fitness, not just muscular strength, you know, to wrestle the car around corners when and, and, and keep control of the car while you're actually driving, but of course, reaction time and coordination as well. They need to um, know when the corner's coming up, you know, Um be able to get their foot on the brake and slow down enough, or, you know, maybe there's been an accident on the track um, and, you know, the safety car comes out and you've got to, um, you've got to be thinking about, okay, I've got to avoid debris or another car on the track. You know, they might only get a second or two as they come around the corner, but the reaction time on those guys is, is, is insane. Uh, I know they do a lot of training for it as well. You know, it's almost, if, if you, you may be seen it guys, it'll be like a, like a wall with loads of what looks like buzzers on them. And like one of them at a time will light up and you've got to react and touch it and turn it off again. And, you know, just checking your, your reaction time to the, the stimulus and how fast you can actually react to it. Um, so another, um, another example of reaction time, it might be just like we just talked about, um, a sprinter getting off the mark when the whistle goes off, you know, or the starting gun goes off. Yeah, how fast can you react to that and get away? Because again, that can make or break. Uh, that that can determine the end result, really. You know, um, again, reaction time. Thinking about um, it. Put you like imagine you're a goalkeeper. Yeah, playing football again, and you know you're defending against a free kick, and you don't see the ball till till late because it gets past the wall. Um, and maybe it takes a deflection on the way through off another player and you've already started to go to your right, then you've got to come across and go to your left instead. Um, that's all reaction time as well. It's all kind of like reflexes and being able to, like, like we say, be able to respond to a, um, be able to respond to a stimulus. Okay, guys, we're getting there. We're getting there. So, like I say, we're thinking about sport or goal-specific training methods, yeah? So we're thinking about um, the fitness training method that is picked or selected should meet the needs of the performer and the fitness requirements of their sport, yeah? It's no good somebody like, um, let's have a think, I don't know, um, who's, who's somebody that everybody knows, um, everybody surely still these days knows, like David Beckham, yeah? So D David Beckham was a footballer, um, when he was training, it'd be pretty pointless him just working on his flexibility, his muscular strength, um, to have a think, his power, his reaction time, when he would be better off focusing on his aerobic endurance and his muscular endurance to keep him being able to run up and down the pitch and being able to, to focus and concentrate on what he should be doing. Um, so... For example, when training for muscular endurance, we're using circuit training, yeah? So we're asking those muscles to do a lot for a longer amount of time, yeah? Rather than working at a heavy weight for one or two repetitions and then resting for a couple of minutes. Because what happens there, guys, you have a couple of minutes to rest, your muscles recover, and they're a lot more fresh when they're going again. So they're not used to, they're not getting used to working when they're tired and working through that point of being tired. They just get to the point where they're tired, you have a little bit of a break, um, and then by the time you come back, you're fresh again, because what you really want for strength training is to be able to do the most weight possible. So the longer you rest, usually the better that's going to work out. You know, you, you, you're going to end up spending a lot of time resting between sets, which doesn't do your muscular endurance any good. Okay, guys. So just to touch on um, the three different body types that we've actually got. So we've got three different body types of which um, people are going to be tend to be better um, suited to different stuff. Yeah. So we've got endomorphs who are rounder bodies uh, with a waist that's often wider than the chest. Um, endomorphs tend to have shorter arms and legs 
and they store fat and build muscle pretty easily, guys. Yeah. So we're thinking somebody like Tyson Fury, yeah, boxer, um, Eddie Hall, strong man, the guy who played um the mountain in Game of Thrones, you know, Thor. Um, not Marvel Thor, the other Thor. Um, those are endomorphs, guys, you know, um, really sort of barrel chested, um, like barrel torso, um, put fat and muscle on really, really easily. Yeah. Then we've got a mesomorph. So average build, usually with natural muscle definition and strength. Um, they, they build muscle really easily and a fast metabolism helps them lose fat and maintain muscle. Yeah. So mesomorphs tend to be, they look and they tend to be a little bit more athletic. Yeah. Broader shoulders. Um, and like I say, when they're eating right and training, they lose fat really easily and they maintain and, and, and gain muscle really easily as well. Um, then we have ectomorphs. So we're ectomorphs. Um, they are naturally thin. Um, people like like myself. Um, they're genetically predisposed to have this body type and are typically skinny um, their whole lives. Yeah. Um, so same again, this, the sort of people that look as though they can eat anything they want and not really put any weight on. Um, those sorts of people. So what you tend to find, guys, is that um, a lot of people are a mix of usually two of these, yeah? So you might be looking at the list and thinking, oh, I can't actually see which of these I would I would fall under, you know? Maybe you see a little bit of yourself in in, in a couple of them, you know? And that's probably more, more close to the truth. You know, you're probably going to find, um, like I say, that you're going to be a mix of two of them, you know? I would say I'm probably ectomorph, naturally thin, um been typically skinny for my whole life um i don't build muscle easily at all um but i do have a fast metabolism yeah and i do lose fat really easily when i when when i want to or when i feel as though i've got any to lose yeah so like i say pros and cons of each body type guys pros and cons um like i say i i appreciate that i'm lucky and then i can get away with eating certain foods or a higher percentage of certain foods than other body types might get away with. At the same time, it's been frustrating over the years, guys, you know, trying to put a little bit of muscle on with a body type and genetics that are kind of always working against you. So there are pros and cons either way. Um, and this is where I'm saying that these can actually give us a bit of an idea where we might be best suited when it comes to exercise and activities. So, um, Thinking about it that way, so ectomorphs, people like myself, if we look at uh, an athlete's example of an ectomorph, again, we're looking at Mo Farah. He's really skinny, always has been, naturally thin. Um, so, of course, he is really good at um, long-distance running because he's not got much muscle to carry with him across that distance that's going to weigh him down. Yeah, he's not carrying anything extra than he needs to, um, you know. So then we've got um, mesomorphs who are probably going to be a little bit more powerful. They've got a little bit more natural muscle. Um, they're a little bit more naturally athletic. So a mesomorph is somebody like Usain Bolt who has that muscle mass um, that helps him actually do what he does a little bit better. Yeah. So mesomorphs that are carrying muscle would probably not have as good a time in long distance running, like I'm saying, compared to an ectomorph. So somebody like you saying bold, he might decide he wants to do short, uh, long distance running. And the end of the day, who's going to stop him? And if you enjoy something, guys, go for it. Our body type doesn't dictate what you can or can't do or should or shouldn't be able to do. It can just give us a little bit of an idea of, you know, where you might have some natural strengths and it might help you find something that you can go and do that's a little bit more encouraging to go back to week on week on week and help you be consistent with it, I guess. You know, it's not about being the best, best there, but, you know, nobody wants to turn up for the first week and feel like they stand, up like, stand out like a sore thumb. Like for me, for example, ectomorph, if I went along and started doing some sumo wrestling, I'm going to get like, I'm going to have a pretty hard time, you know, pretty much everybody there is going to be more naturally better at sumo wrestling than me as an ectomorph, you know? 
Whereas endomorphs are perfect for it. They're perfect for it. You know, we're looking like, again, Eddie Hall, power, powerlifting, strongman competitions, that sort of thing. Um, that's where endomorphs tend to be um, more naturally suited. Stuff like discus, shot put, javelin, because they've got more mass behind them to generate more power as they go to, you know, release whatever it is that they're throwing. So we can see, guys, how, yeah, you know, your body type should never dictate what you can and can't do, like I say, but we can see how um, some of the examples that we've looked at, their body types have actually helped them be the best in the world. You know, Usain Bolt is, isn't the fastest man alive without his body being the way that it is. Yeah, so um, Usain Bolt, um, like I say, He's got a little bit. He's got a little bit more muscle. Um, he's got a little bit more mass. He would not be able to just go and jump into those other things. Yeah. Um. Again, he could do them. He could go along and he could probably have a bit of a giggle and enjoy himself doing it. And there's no harm in that. You know what? Like I say, you don't have to be the best at everything. It's about enjoying yourself while we're while we're while we're on the journey. You know. But Usain Ball could never go to long distance running and become the best in the world because he's just not built right. You know, he's, he's perfect for, um, he's perfect for short distance running. You know, it's exactly the same as Mo Farah as a ectomorph. He could never go into strong man. He's never going to be the world's strongest man, you know, because again, um, he's just not got the genetics to help him be the best in the world. You know, again, we can look at some some other examples, like uh, one that I use, um, like Michelle Kwan. She used to be a figure skater, um, you know, like um, internationally recognized Olympic gold medalist. Um, and some of her traits, you know, flexibility, mus- muscular endurance, all of that sort of thing, um, again, helped her be the best in, in, in the world at a time, you know. Um, so playing the strengths, is kind of the only way to be the best and be at the top of your field, I guess. Um, again, not that that's always the most important thing, guys. Um, sometimes doing a little bit of something's better than doing nothing. Um, and like I say, if you can enjoy yourself while you're doing it, then, then that's great. But like I say, we can see now why certain people with certain body types end up being the best in the world or, or what it is that they do, you know, just because they've got the genetics for it. Um, Arnold Schwarzenegger, you know, classic mesomorph. Arnold Schwarzenegger at, I think, about 14 had more muscle on him than I do now, you know, at 29. So, again, everybody that ran against him, anybody who ran against Arnold Schwarzenegger in the Mr. Olympia for like seven, eight years in a row, essentially had no chance because of just the genetics that he had. You know, there's no way to outmaneuver those genetics when that person is also working as hard as you and doing all the right things. You're doing all the right things too. You just haven't got those genetics, you know? Um, and like I say, I think he won seven Mr. Olympias in a row and just nobody, nobody could get near him. Like your physical prime doesn't last that long, you know? So for people to be able to get nowhere near him for seven years is, was, is absolutely amazing really. And again, testament to the, to the genetics that he had. Um, okay, guys, last couple of slides we've got to work through. So we've talked about, we've briefly talked about and touched on some different um, fitness um, fitness testing methods. You know, I know I mentioned the sitting ridge test earlier on and the skin full calipers, um, but there's a couple more as well. So let's just have a, a quick whip through these. So there's a variety of fitness testing methods which athletes and sports performers can use. Um, another one would be resting heart rate. Yes, yeah, so you can actually just take your fingers or even just use a, like a, a Fitbit or a smartwatch if you've got one because they're becoming more and more affordable these days. So maybe you've got one of them. If not, you're just taking two fingers, putting them on your wrist or your neck to find your pulse. Yeah, and you're finding your pulse. You count how many times it beats per minute. That gives you your resting heart rate, yeah? Resting just meaning... That you've that you've checked it, sort of 
in a state where you haven't done any exercise beforehand, you know. So maybe you do it before you start warming up, or maybe you do it when you first get up on a morning. Um, because of course when you're sitting around, the demand on your body isn't as much, so your heart and your lungs aren't working quite as hard. Um, so that's your resting heart rate. So what you can actually do then, you can do some exercise, and then you can check your heart rate again, and you can compare it to your resting heart rate. You can see how much it's it, it's come up you know how much it's spiked up as you've started exercising and um, so sort of like an average or a healthy resting heart rate is normally between 60 and 80 beats a minute so same again you can get an idea whether your heart is working harder than it should be when you're just sitting around not doing a great deal it's not got any reason to be higher than normal so, yeah, you can actually check your heart rate when you're at a state of rest and see if your heart is beating harder than sort of 60 to 80 beats per minute. Um, and that can give you an idea just sort of where your aerobic fitness is at. Blood pressure is another one. Of course, blood pressure, we need blood pressure. Otherwise, all of our blood would just be at the mercy of gravity and rush to our feet. Um, and blood pressure, of course, helps us pump the blood around the body and deliver that oxygen. Um, so what we can actually do we can do a blood pressure measurement, which is, um, you've maybe had it before where you get the inflatable sleeve, it goes over your arm and then it's going to inflate and it'll give you two numbers. Yeah. And that's just going to tell you how, um, how hard you, how much pressure is in your system as your heart is beating, um, to, um, provide the, the oxygen and the blood around the body. So when we're talking about blood pressure, we're checking out, like I say, to see sort of how hard your heart is working um, and how much pressure is in your um, blood vessels. So within your veins and arteries and stuff like that, um, are you at a risk of heart disease um, or, or sort of heart failure or something like that? Blood pressure, are you looking at potentially having blockages in arteries and stuff from fats and bad food that's, that's increasing um, the, the the capacity and therefore the pressure that's in your in your blood vessels as well. So blood pressure is a really important one, um, and we're gonna we're gonna talk in just a second about what those numbers actually mean, because all too often you'll go to the doctors, you'll go for your medical, your checkup or whatever it is, they'll give you two numbers and you don't know what they mean, and then they send you on your way and you don't know whether it's good or bad, you know, or what like I say, what the implication is or how we can even change them. So yeah, we'll have a little bit of a look at that. BMI is the is is the uh, body mass index that we've maybe seen before, where you've got you get your height, you'll get your weight, and then you'll match them up in the middle, and you'll find out if you are a healthy weight for your height. Yeah, it's not the be all and end all, guys. Like if you were carrying on a muscle, but you were really lean and in really good shape, the BMI would probably still tell you you were overweight. Yeah. But if you're not doing any exercise or you haven't done much exercise and you're not worried about, you know, carrying a ridiculous amount of lean muscle like most of us aren't, you know, it can be a good idea and a good starting point to see, okay, am I, am I heavy for my height right now? Do I maybe need to reduce it a little bit or maybe just need to put a little bit of weight on, you know? So that is where we would use a BMI. One rep max, guys, is just a fancy term for how heavy can you lift something once? Yeah. How heavy can you do one repetition to completion? Yeah. Um, and like I say, like I say, you, you would do it once. You either manage it or you fail. Yeah. Um, and that, that is your one rep max testing, really, guys. Sit and reach was what I mentioned earlier on where we're checking our fitness. Yeah. So you're sitting with your legs outstretched, touching a box, um, and you're going to try and lean forward and touch the box. And if you can, even get your hands onto the top of the box and see how far across the box you can actually reach. Um, and then, of course, we've got our skin fold calipers that I mentioned earlier on again, which we can use to just do, um, like I say, nip. Um, normally, like I say, it'd be the back of the arm, uh, the waistline, and the sort of on top of the sh uh, shoulder blade and the scapula. Um, is normally where we do the measurements um, and see sort of how much body fat is resting there. Um, and then, like I say, we can go from there and work our body fat percentage and stuff like that. Um, another way of testing a similar sort of thing um, would be to do 
the body circumference measurements. So you get a tape measure and you can just measure somebody's waist if you wanted to, you know, if, you know, they've maybe it's got quite a high body fat percentage and, you know, you'd be a bit, a little bit conscious of going over and starting to like squeeze their side and stuff like that. You could do, um, like I say, circumference measurements. That will tell you, okay, around my waist is 28 inches or whatever. Um, it's either going to go up or it's going to go down, you know, which tells you you either, you know, your body composition is getting better or, or worse usually, you know, hopefully better. And, you know, your clothes will start to feel a little bit looser um, or, or just, just, just not be as tight. So I've used that quite a lot as well because that can be another way to say, okay, you've lost, you've lost two inches around your waist in the last month. Um, so, of course, your body composition is getting better that way as well. Um, but of course, as always, guys, the method of testing that we're selecting and, and rolling with um, should relate specifically to the components that we're trying to test. Yeah, so same again. If you're trying to test your flexibility and doing your blood pressure is not going to tell you that. Yeah. If you want to know um, your aerobic fitness and your aerobic endurance, your resting heart rate is going to be a really good place to start with that. Getting the skin fold calipers out and starting to measure your body fat gives you no indication, guys, on how your aerobic fitness is. So think about what tests you're actually doing based on what components you're trying to improve and what components of fitness are most important to yourself. Yeah, because like I say, it's really hard to develop all of these aspects of fitness at the same time. Yeah, really hard. There's almost not enough, not enough hours in the day, guys. Okay, guys, last couple of slides then, last couple of slides. So we've got, um, thinking about blood pressure. So like we say, blood pressure is needed to pump blood around the body. Otherwise, it would just gravitate to the lowest parts of the body. Yeah. Um, so pressure is the greatest at the aorta, like we talked about last week, as the left ventricle pumps blood through it. And then it shoots out in that main artery, the aorta, and it gets around the body. Yeah. So by the time the blood reaches the capillaries and it, it's come all the way back to the lungs, it is, um, it's still under pressure, but not as high as at the uh, aorta. Yeah. So the closer to the heart it is where it's pumped, um, the pressure is going to be higher. Yeah. Which is why, again, it's sometimes like really, really overdone in movies and stuff. But if you see anybody cut an artery or something and you see it spurting, that is exactly how it would go in real life. It would spurt rather than trickle because, and, and sometimes quite aggressively as well because of that pressure um, based on, on, on where the injury or where the wound is. Um, so, yeah, that's what our blood pressures, um, that's what we're testing when we're checking our um, blood pressure. So there's two phases of blood pressure. We've got systolic and we've got diastolic. Yeah, so we've got systolic, is the pressure when your heart contracts and, and, and beats and pumps the blood, yeah? So that's systolic. So it makes sense that the first number is going to be the higher of the two because it's as the heart actually squeezes, yeah, and forces the blood around the body. The second number is diastolic. So it's the pressure when the heart relaxes between beats. So it's like sort of slowly inflating again before it can beat again, yeah? So you've got, boom, your systolic, Expanding again, diastolic, back to systolic, diastolic. So that, that, those are what those two numbers are. And we can actually see our ranges here. So for systolic, the first number, as the heart beats, 120 to 139 um, is normal. Anything sort of 140 plus is classed as hypertension um, and, and sort of needs addressing. And for diastolic, we're talking anywhere from 80 to 89 is, is, is sort of normal. 90 upwards again. And is hypertension uh, and needs needs a little bit more attention. So those are those are the brackets for what's sort of normal um, and healthy. And at the same time, guys, now we also know what those two numbers mean. So we can actually think about the context of it a little bit more um, and apply it a little bit more. Um, okay, guys, that'll wrap us up for today then. Um, or we can we can we can start and begin wrapping up. Um, so, so what we've actually got uh, this week is a brand new workbook to start working through. So it's the Planning Your Own Fitness Program workbook. Um, to the best of my knowledge, I'm just going to have a look now. Um, should be, so for the, 
video for today's session. Of course, we've got the description section underneath. There's a little drop drop down arrow you should be able to click. So, guys, the, the workbook is in there. Yeah, and I'll, I'll boot that workbook up in a minute and we'll have a look at some of the uh, exercises that we're going to be doing. But it's pages two to seven in that new workbook, guys. Just start working through and do what you can. Um, extra little bit of homework. Try doing your own heart rate. Try checking your own heart rate using that pulse. Like I say, two fingers on your, on your wrist or on your neck. Don't use your thumb as tempting as it is because you can sometimes feel the beat in the thumb as well which throws off the count and throws off your numbers. So, yeah. Um, try checking your heart rate. And then once you've done this week's fitness video, check your heart rate again and see how much it's come up. Yeah, so um, like I say, the workbook's in there, but so is the fitness video again, guys. The link to the fitness video is in the description as well. If you're not feeling the um, interval session that I've sort of um, recommended for the day's session, Follow that link, try one of the other sessions, you know, maybe you fancy a nice little stretch with it being a nice sunny morning. It is here anyway. Um, maybe you fancy something a bit more intense and you want to go for a full body workout, you know, or maybe you do just want to do the one that I've um, sort of paired up with today's session and recommend it because I want you to think about those different components of fitness as much as you can while you're exercising as well and thinking which of those components are you actually developing through each, through each um, exercise. Yeah. So, of course, as always, guys, all the supplementary learner info is in there as well. If you need the, the learner handbook, if you need um, more information on sort of safeguarding um, e learning, you know, learning safely online, um, any of that sort of thing. Links to our social media pages are in there as well. So, if you want to um, get connected that way, check them out there in the description as well. Um, my email, of course, as always, is in the description if you need me. Um, of course, you've probably already got it because I'm emailing links out to these sessions every week. But if you haven't got it, it's there uh, and you know how to get hold of me. If you're missing a workbook or whatever and can't find it, let me know and I'll send it over to you. And then the last thing to mention um, in that uh, description section is the survey, guys. Um, so each of you we need just um, a survey which is one little 30 second survey doing for each session that we do um, and it gives us some really important feedback that we can use for paperwork on this end on your behalf but like I say it's just nice to get a little bit of feedback as well guys and find out where your where your thoughts are on stuff so please don't forget to do that survey guys um, like I say that's in the description as well so you don't even need to worry about downloading it guys if you click that link It'll take you straight to the page, type all your information on there. Um, and then once you submit that or save that, it'll come straight back to us. You don't need to, you don't need to faff on downloading it and filling it in and emailing it back. You know, um, literally just follow the link, add your info there, um, anything that you're going to add, and then it just pings straight back to us, guys. So really handy and saving you doing all the emailing and stuff like that. So only 30 seconds, guys. Um, so yeah, don't forget to do the survey. Check out the way uh, the workout video um, and let's just have a quick look at the workbook so you know that we're doing the, um, where are we at, where are we at, so you know that you're on the right one. Okay, guys, so just wait for this PowerPoint to load up and then we'll have a look at um, the sessions that we're going to be doing. Okay, so share screen. There we go, guys. So this is the booklet that you're looking for for this week's session. Yeah, this is the one that you're going to want. So planning your own fitness program. So in this unit, you're going to learn basic components of physical fitness, different ways you can assess your own fitness, how to plan your own fitness program and set targets, and to apply your own fitness program over a four-week period. Um, to identify barriers to achieving fitness goals, how to overcome those barriers, and how to review your own fitness program. So what we're doing, pages two to seven. So we've got outline the components of physical fitness and a suggested sport that goes with them, which, we've, which we covered earlier. Um, assessing your own fitness level. Yeah, so we're going to think about can we do any of these in the house to, to check your own results, see how you're actually getting on fitness-wise. Do your resting heart rate and record that. 
Um, hard red zones we get more of a chance to look at in next week's session, but by all means, read ahead if you want. Um, that was page five, six, and then seven if you want to. You can just have a look at the BMI chart as well, and you can actually track yourself where you are on the BMI chart. So like I said, you find your... Um, you find your weight either in kilograms or I think it's stones and pounds on this side. Yeah, stones and pounds. And then at the top, we've got height. Yeah, so I can come down and, um, in fact, do we have height in feet at the bottom? Yeah, that would be a nice one. So I am about, let's be ambitious here. I'm about five, seven, maybe five, seven kilograms. I am. Five, seven kilograms. I am about 60, 62. So in here somewhere, 21, 22, um, which is... Now oh, that hasn't got the um, different sections on. All right, guys, let's have a look. Let's have a look. Let's get this cleared up before we uh, wrap up for the day. So we've got... Um, BMI result checker. So, so what we've got, we've got underweight. Yeah, we've got underweight. We've got a healthy weight. We've got overweight, only slightly overweight. Um, and then we've got obese yeah so obesity so what i was saying earlier on guys like if you if you were carrying a lot of muscle you could be like i've worked with some people who are really really lean but still weigh 100 kilograms yeah whereas this here is saying that nobody at 100 kilograms really Nobody at, at, at any height really should be a hundred kilograms. Yeah. So, like I say, you could be if you were if you were the same height as me, but carrying another something. thing. If you were the same height as me, five seven ish, and you were carrying an extra two stone. Yeah, you'd be overweight. If I put two stone on guys, I'd be classed as overweight. You know. So. I don't think I would look overweight to anybody if I put another two stone on, guys, really. So take the BMI with a pinch of salt is what I'm saying. But again, handy place to sort of jump in and have a look and see where you do fall and then make a little note of it in that box there, guys. And then, like I say, we'll look at page six, which was the heart rate barriers. No, page five, which was the heart rate barriers and the heart rate zones um, next week. Yeah. Cool. Right, guys. So we will wrap up there then. So as always, please don't forget to do that survey and um, give me a shout in the meantime, if you need anything, if you're struggling with anything. Um, like I say, you know where I'm at, you know where my email is, if you haven't already got it. Um, and keep up what you're doing, guys. Keep up what you're doing. You know, I've had a couple of workbooks come back already. Same again, just steady away. You can either keep all of them till they're done at the end of the course. Or you can wait till just that workbook's done and send that workbook back. It's entirely up to you guys, however you want to do it. Um, but that is the plan for this week. So it is the planning your own fitness program workbook, pages two up to seven. Um, fill in what you can. And like I say, we will be back at it next week. Yeah. So like I say, check your heart rate after you've done a little bit of exercise next as well. See how much it does come up compared to your resting heart rate. Um, and we will be back next week with a brand new session uh, and we'll keep this ball rolling guys and um, as always thank you for tuning in and um, stay safe look after yourselves stay out of trouble and i will be uh we'll be back same time next week to do it all again cool thanks again guys i will see you next week